Welcome back to English is Easy, the best YouTube channel for breaking through into true English fluency. I'm your host, Connor. Today, we have another deep work session. We are going to be reading a classic story, the story of Stone Soup. So here's the plan for today. First, I'm going to quickly read the story to you. You can sit back, relax, and listen. This part of the lesson will probably just take two or three minutes. Then we will jump into the vocabulary breakdown and take a look at some of the more challenging language used in the story. Make sure that we understand everything, all of the difficult vocabulary. Then, in the third part of the lesson, we get into the real meat and potatoes. That means the most useful main part of the lesson. We will do a deep dive into the story, revisit the story. Yeah, look at it again, but this time we will go line by line and make sure that we fully understand everything in the story. Finally, at the end of today's lesson, we will have discussion questions and speaking practice. This will be a really good opportunity to not just practice your reading and listening skills like we're going to do in the first part of the lesson, but also to practice your spoken English skills. If all of that sounds good to you guys and you are ready to dive in very quickly, I have a small favor to ask. Please make sure that you've liked this video. Make sure you are a subscriber on the channel here and maybe even leave me a comment. You can challenge yourself to use one of today's challenging vocab words. Okay, with all of that being said, let's jump into the lesson. Beginning with the quick read of the story, once again, all you need to do is sit back, relax, and listen as I read the story quickly to you. The Story of Stone Soup Three monks, weary from their travels, arrived at a village that was known for being stingy and unfriendly. The villagers had become bitter due to hard times, and they were not inclined to share their food or hospitality. Their clothes were disheveled, and their faces showed signs of wariness. The monks decided to teach the villagers a lesson in generosity. They set up a pot in the village square and filled it with water. Then one of the monks placed a large, smooth stone into the pot. Curious villagers began to gather around, wondering what the monks were doing. "'What are you making?' asked one villager. "'We are making stone soup.' replied the monk. It will be very delicious, but it would taste even better with a few carrots. Intrigued, a villager brought some carrots and added them to the pot. Another villager, not wanting to be outdone, brought potatoes. Soon, more and more villagers contributed to the soup with beans, onions, and meat. The once bitter villagers were now working together each person adding something to the pot. As the soup began to simmer, the delicious aroma spread through the village. The monks stirred the pot, and the villagers watched with anticipation. One monk remarked, this is going to be the best stone soup ever, especially with such sumptuous ingredients. The villagers, who had been so overwhelmed in their own hardships, began to smile and talk with one another. The soup was finally ready, and everyone in the village gathered to enjoy the meal. They were amazed at how a simple stone and a little cooperation had created such a hearty soup. After that day, the villagers were no longer stingy. They realized that by sharing and working together, they could create something wonderful. The monks had shown them that even in hard times, there is always something to give. The villagers promised to reciprocate the monks' kindness by being more generous in the future. As they say, many hands make light work. 
All right, awesome work, guys. That was a very quick read of today's story, of the story Stone Soup. I'm curious how that was for you. Was that too easy, too difficult, or maybe it was just right? You can let me know down in the comments. We're going to next jump into the vocabulary breakdown. In other words, we are going to take a closer look at some of the more advanced words and language in the story, and we're going to begin with disheveled. Maybe you can practice saying that with me. Disheveled. 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 That's an adjective. What does it mean? Untidy. Messy. Not neat. Not organized. Okay, in English we can say disorganized. Okay, so yeah, maybe uh, messy, unkempt. These are all different ways or synonyms for disheveled, okay? The antonyms or opposite words, words that mean the opposite of disheveled might be tidy, might be neat, might be organized, organized, might be put together. Ah, Okay? Yeah, if your friend is really put together, then they're dressed well, their hair is looking good, you know, they don't look messy, they don't look untidy or disorganized, they look prepared and ready to go, they look put together. Okay? Let's take a look at two example sentences. The first one is going to be from our story today, Stone Soup. The second will be unrelated to the story. One, the villagers were disheveled from their hard lives, okay? So the villagers, you know, they're not doing too well. They're messy. They're untidy. They are unkempt. This is a really terrific word, unkempt. Kind of a literary word that you might see more in books than you would in real life, okay? But yeah, the villagers, you know, they have hard lives, they have fallen on hard times, hard times, or we can say tough times. Times are tough, and they're not doing so well, so they don't look very put together. They look disheveled. Take a look at number two. His hair was disheveled after the windy day. Ah, okay, so here, windy day is like the key idea in the sentence. The wind blew really hard right? And it messed up his hair. So now his hair, it looks disheveled. Um, I'm going to do something a little different in today's lesson. Down here, I'm going to draw a picture. I really love drawing. I really love doodling. Sometimes we say doodle for a little drawing, right? So sometimes when I'm learning new words, I find that it's very useful, very helpful, very beneficial. If I draw a picture, and that might even help me remember, okay? So I'm going to draw a picture to help us remember disheveled and what it means. If you're following along at home, if you're following along with a PDF, then maybe you can do the same, okay? So first of all, I'm going to draw somebody who's looking organized and tidy and neat, right? Take a look at this guy. He's looking good. He's ready to go. I'll draw some little sparkly, <laughs> some sparkly lines too, so we can see that he's looking squeaky clean, organized, ready to go, put together. On the other side, we have him after he, uh, his hair and his outfit, his clothes, his whole appearance got messed up by the wind on his way to work. So over here, oh man, he's looking frazzled, right? He is not looking good. He's got some bags under his eyes. He's looking disheveled. So this side is disheveled. This side is organized, put together, neat, tidy. Okay, our next word for today is sumptuous. Okay, an adjective, so it describes a noun. That's what adjectives do. They tell you more about a person or about a place or about a thing. 
So a simple definition, a simple way of thinking about it is splendid, expensive looking. But we could also say very rich, very fancy, luxurious, lavish. These are all ways, different ways, to say basically the same thing, which is that something is sumptuous, okay? Now, the opposite of sumptuous might be plain, might be simple. So there's a big divide between the words on this side and the words on this side, okay? Yeah, think about a meal, a sumptuous meal it might be really expensive. It might cost a lot of money. It might be held in a fancy hotel or a fancy restaurant, whereas on the flip side, on the other side, a plain meal, a simple meal, an ordinary, ordinary meal might be, you know, just a really basic meal had at home, maybe some home cooking, okay? In the sentence we saw, one monk remarked, that just means said, this is going to be the best stone soup ever, especially with such sumptuous ingredients. Ah, okay. So the ingredients used in the stone soup to the monks and to the villagers, they seem very sumptuous, okay? Now, maybe to us, to you, to me, maybe they don't seem so fancy or lavish, luxurious, rich, expensive. Maybe they don't seem like that to us because what are we talking about? We're talking about potatoes, onions, carrots, right? To us, it's just normal food. But remember, we're talking about poor villagers and these traveling monks who, uh, you know, ordinarily probably don't eat anything sumptuous at all, nothing fancy, nothing rich. So to them, these common ingredients seem very sumptuous, okay? Here's another good example down here. The banquet was filled with sumptuous dishes and decorations. Okay, so this means food, right? The dishes are sumptuous, but not only that, the decorations are sumptuous as well, okay? So the way that the banquet is decorated, what is a banquet? It's like a fancy dinner, okay? A fancy dinner. Maybe you've been to a banquet hall, like a big, big, big room where fancy dinners are held. There's a lot of nice food and a lot of important people at banquet dinners. Now down here, let's draw a picture again. Something sumptuous, okay? Yeah, something sumptuous. You know, I'm first on this side, going to draw a dinky little sailboat. Now, there's a fisherman on the sailboat, and, you know, he's happy with his plain, simple, ordinary sailboat. It's nothing sumptuous. It's nothing luxurious or rich or fancy. Um, but it is not sumptuous, right? Maybe it's enough for him, but it's not sumptuous. Now look at this side. We have a giant yacht, a yacht. A yacht is a very expensive, very big private boat, okay? And up here, we have a rich guy. Maybe he's wearing sunglasses. Look at that. He's wearing sunglasses, fancy, expensive, designer, sumptuous sunglasses, and his boat is really expensive. So one person is living a very sumptuous lifestyle, a lifestyle or a way of living, right? And the other is, you know, living an ordinary life. Up next, another fantastic, really useful advanced vocabulary word, reciprocate. It's a verb. It's something you do to give something in return. Okay, so to give back, to return, to repay somebody. And here's the line that separates them. Here's the antonyms down here, the words that mean the opposite, right? Ignore, neglect. Those two words are antonyms. They mean the opposite of reciprocate. So imagine if Teacher Connor gave you a gift. 
right? And then you decided to give me a gift back. Who's reciprocating? Is it me or is it you? We both gave gifts, right? I gave a gift, you gave a gift, but I was the first person to give a gift. First, I gave you a gift, then you responded by giving back, right? So I don't reciprocate, you reciprocate by giving back to me. It just means you give back. The villagers promised to reciprocate the monk's kindness, right? So first, the monks were very, very kind to the villagers. Um, They offered to make this stone soup, and that made the villagers very happy. The villagers decided to give back, right? They decided to reciprocate. When someone does you a favor, it's good to reciprocate right? Uh, Somebody does something nice for you. It's good to give back. It's good to return the favor. Return the favor. There's a good expression in English. It just means to uh, return the kindness, to pay them back, to give something back, right? To reciprocate. So, you know, for the picture, maybe we show one guy and he's giving a present to his friend, right? And here's his friend accepting the present. Well, guess what his friend does next? He's thinking about what he's going to give back to his friend. He's thinking about how he's going to reciprocate. One more piece of language I want to take a look at is many hands make light work. That's an idiom, an expression something that people say, right? It means working together makes a task easier. So in other words, teamwork helps. Collaboration lightens the load. Hmm, lightens the load. Load means um, a burden. It could be talking about literally a physical burden. If you're carrying something heavy, that can be a heavy load. But we can also talk about a mental load, a mental burden, an emotional burden, an emotional load, right? Um, And we can lighten those things as well, okay? In this particular situation, collaborating, we're probably talking about the load of work, okay? A lot of work that needs to be done. Now, antonyms for this Opposite words might be working alone, working solo. In the world of music, you often uh, hear that some musicians are solo musicians, meaning that they work by themselves, they don't work with a band, they don't make music with a group of people, they work all by themselves. That makes them a solo musician, right? Um, In the story... As they say, many hands make light work. That's what we saw in the story. And the context was that all of the villagers come together and collaborate or cooperate. They work together. And by working together, by utilizing teamwork, they are able to create a much better soup than they would have been able to if they all made their own soup solo or individually, okay? We finished the project quickly because many hands make light work. By working together, they were able to finish the project quickly, okay? Uh, Solo or working alone, that project might have taken a really long time, but many hands make light work. Now, if you look down here, very quickly, I'm going to make a drawing, and you're going to see many hands, right? Just like in the idiom. Many hands, what are they doing? They're lifting a giant rock. Now, this rock would be impossible to lift solo, impossible to lift by yourself, but many hands make light work. They are collaborating. They are cooperating. They are working together, working as a team. That makes it work. All right, guys, we did a quick read of the story. 
Then we broke down some of the more difficult vocabulary words that we saw in the story. Now it's time for the meat and potatoes. <laughs> the meat and potatoes portion of the video or part of the video. The meat and potatoes, that means the most important part or the, um, uh, the most substantial part. Yeah, maybe not the most important, but the biggest part, the main part, okay? So what we're going to do is go line by line again through the story and just break everything down. This is the part of the lesson where you can really make some, some uh, impressive progress with your English. So let's give it a shot. Shall we? Let's take a look. Three monks, weary from their travels, arrived at a village that was known for being stingy and unfriendly. Okay, let's start with this. Three monks. What is a monk? Another way of thinking about a monk might be like a religious man or a holy man. And often, you know, this story was taken from uh, Southeast Asia. Oftentimes in Southeast Asia, these are traveling monks, monks who travel the countryside, right? Okay, so these holy men, they're traveling. They are weary from their travels. Weary, that just means tired. They're exhausted from traveling, right? They arrive at a village, and this village has a reputation. People know about this village. Why? Because it's stingy and unfriendly. The villagers, the people who live in this village, they are stingy. They are unfriendly. Stingy means a little bit selfish with what you have, a little bit greedy, a little bit unwilling to share, okay? You really cling on to your possessions and you're not willing to part with them. The villagers, these stingy and unfriendly villagers, they had become bitter due to hard times. So because times are tough, because, uh, you know, things are a little difficult right now, the villagers are bitter. They feel that the world has turned against them. They feel that life is unfair, and that makes them resentful. Here's another good word resentful. In other words, full of resentment. They're angry. They're unhappy. They're upset, right? So these villagers, they were not inclined to share their food or hospitality. They were not inclined to. That means they don't want to. They don't want to. They don't feel like doing this, right? Uh, they're not inclined to share. Share what? Share their food, for one. Share their hospitality, for two. Hospitality. Hospitality. What does that mean? Hospitality is when you take care of a guest. You welcome them into your home, you look after them, you uh, give them what they need to feel comfortable, right? That is showing hospitality. Their clothes were disheveled and their faces showed signs of weariness, okay? There's a vocab word, disheveled. That means disorganized, untidy, looking unkempt, right? Their clothes are like a mess and their faces showed signs of weariness, okay? So they're looking really tired. Well, the monks decided to teach the villagers a lesson in generosity or giving, okay? Being generous with the things you have, being willing to give away the things you have. They set up a pot, something you use for cooking, in the village square, or the middle part of the village, and they filled it with water. Then one of the monks placed a large, smooth stone into the pot. A smooth stone, so it's not rough. The surface is maybe glossy, maybe smooth. Nothing catches your hand. If you were to push your hand, rub your hand across the surface, 
It would feel slick. It would not feel rough. That's what smooth means, right? So curious villagers began to gather around, wondering what the monks were doing. We have some curious villagers. Hmm? They want to know more. What's going on here? So they gather around. They kind of see the monks, you know, doing what they're doing, and they come gather around the monks to get a better look. What are you making? asked one villager. We are making stone soup, replied the monk. The monk said back, it will be very delicious, very yummy, very good to eat, but it would taste even better with a few carrots. Intrigued. That means interested, right? Interested. A villager brought some carrots and added them to the pot. Another villager, a second villager, not wanting to be outdone, brought potatoes. I really like this part. This second villager, he feels a little bit competitive, right? He sees the first villager put, uh, uh, um, um, contributing, okay? Pitching in, pitching in. He sees the first villager being, you know, helpful and contributing. He doesn't want to be outdone. He says, hey, I'm not going to let you have all the glory. I'm not going to let you steal the spotlight. He wants to contribute as well. So he brings potatoes. Soon, more and more villagers contributed or added to the soup with beans, onions, meat, all of these different ingredients. Okay, And remember, these ingredients to the villagers and to the monks are very sumptuous. They're luxurious, fancy, expensive things, okay? The once bitter villagers were now working together, each person adding something to the pot, okay? People are cooperating, they're collaborating, people are coming together, working together, okay? As the soup began to simmer, mm, so it's bubbling a little bit. Maybe simmering is a step below boiling. If water is boiling, it's very hot. There's lots of bubbles in the water. If it's simmering, that means it's just starting to boil. It's not a full boil yet, but it's getting there. It's getting hotter. The delicious aroma, the smell. An aroma, that's a good smell. An aroma, that means a good smell, okay? How would we say a bad smell? We could say an odor for a bad smell. If it's a bad smell, we say a stench or an odor. For a good smell, a pleasant smell, we say aroma, okay? So this aroma, it spread through the village. The monks stirred the pot and the villagers watched with anticipation. Ah, so the villagers, they are watching eagerly. They want to see the outcome. They are eager to see the result. One monk remarked, remarked just means said, this is going to be the best stone soup ever, especially with such sumptuous ingredients right? So he's basically saying this is going to be great, um, especially because, okay, it's going to be, uh, uh, one reason it's going to be great is because of the sumptuous ingredients, the really fancy, nice, rich ingredients, okay? The villagers who had been so overwhelmed in their own hardships, problems, Okay, that's what a hardship is, a problem. They began to smile and talk with one another. So the villagers before, they had felt very overwhelmed. That means like you don't know what to do. You are at wit's end. If you are really overwhelmed, you're at wit's end. That means you really don't know what to do. Because of their hardships, because of these difficulties that they're going through and experiencing. So they had been overwhelmed in the past, 
But now something is changing, right? They begin to smile. They begin to talk with one another. Maybe they weren't even talking before. Yeah, maybe they had been kind of, you know, closed off to each other. Maybe they had just been keeping to themselves. And maybe they'd been standoffish. There's a great word. Standoffish. If you're standoffish, then you seem like the kind of person who is not super willing to engage in conversation. Maybe you wait for other people to talk to you. You don't take the initiative to talk to them. And even then, even if they do talk to you, you're kind of like this. You're kind of, mm, I'm not sure I really want to engage with you. Mm, I'm not sure I want to uh, converse, talk with you, right? The soup was finally ready, finally ready to eat, and everyone in the village gathered to enjoy the meal. They were amazed, maybe surprised, pleasantly surprised, right, at how a simple stone and a little cooperation, working together, had created such a hearty soup. Ah, here's a good word. If we can... If we describe the soup as being hearty, or if you describe a meal as being hearty, then that means it really fills you up, it really fills you up, and it really warms you. Like, imagine that you are trekking through the snow. You're in some very cold, snowy place, and you arrive at a log cabin. You open the door, and this delicious aroma wafts over you, right? And you see that someone is cooking a hearty stew. Why do we describe that stew or soup as being hearty? Well, because you know that if you were to eat that stew, it would really fill you up. It would really warm you. It's like really good home cooking that makes you feel good inside, right? That's a hearty meal or a hearty soup, okay? After that day, the villagers were no longer stingy. No longer stingy. That means they used to be, not anymore. They realized that by sharing and working together, they could create something wonderful. Wonderful just means really good, right? The monks had shown them that even in hard times, there's always something to give, right? Even if you feel like you don't have anything that you can contribute, if you feel beaten down by life, if you feel bitter like the villagers did, what the monks showed them is that even during these times, you can always find something to give. You can always find a way to be selfless. Selfless. Literally without self, right? Find a way to be generous, to help people, okay? The villagers promised to uh, reciprocate the monk's kindness by being more generous, more willing to give in the future. So, the, villages, the villagers promise the monks and they say, you know what, we are going to reciprocate this kindness that you've shown us here today. They say, you know, today you have shown us how to be kind. We are going to reciprocate in the future. That means, you know, in the future, after today, we are going to do a better job of giving back, reciprocating, right? As they say, Many hands make light work. So maybe in the future, these monks, they will be more willing, you know, to work together and help each other out. If you are still watching, I applaud you. You're doing an awesome job. You're making a big investment in yourself and in your future as an English speaker. So well done. The next thing I want to do is take a look at these three discussion questions. So yeah, these questions will help us think a little bit more deeply about the story and about our own lives. And then we can practice our speaking and respond to these questions out loud. Okay, now don't worry. For each of these responses, I will give you a demonstration. 
of what I would like you to do or what I would like you to try and do, okay? So look at number one. If you were one of the villagers, what would you have added to the stone soup and why? If you lived in this village, what would you have added to the stone soup, okay? So I'd like you to take a minute, one minute, and try to respond to this. I'll go first. So if I was one of the villagers and I lived in this village of stingy, unfriendly people, I would like to think that I would be different. You know, everybody likes to think that they are special or that they are different somehow. But I would really hope that if I was in this situation, I would be more generous, okay? I would be more giving than the other villagers, more helpful, more kind, okay? So I think I would try to give the best thing I had to give. Maybe that would be meat, you know, if I had some some beef or some pork or some chicken. Uh, if I had, you know, some some really nice vegetables, maybe I would give that. But I would like to think that if, an, if I was in this situation, <laughs> I would uh, do a good job of sharing. Okay, that was my response. Now it's your turn. Take that full minute. Don't stop talking. Reply to this question. Go ahead. Our second question is, how do you think the story of Stone Soup teaches us about community and generosity? So in other words, what does this story show us about these themes or ideas? Once again, I'll go first. Yeah, the story of Stone Soup is a really, really great lesson in generosity and community and sharing. Now, why do I say that? I say that because we see directly in the story a before and after situation, right? In the before situation, we see a village full of people who are stingy. They are unfriendly. They're unkind, unwelcoming. They don't have any hospitality to give. Here's a $10 word. They're very acrimonious, acrimonious just means bitter and angry, right? But after they learn how to share and how to work together, their community flourishes. It does really well, okay? So obviously, we all have a lot to learn from this story, from that lesson, okay? That was my response. Now it's your turn. Go ahead.
One final discussion question today. Can you think of a time when working together with others made a task easier or more enjoyable? Share your experience. So basically, can you think of a time when working together with a team made something a lot easier? I will go first. Here's my response. You know, I study Chinese. And when I was in college, I studied Chinese. And what I found was very interesting. I found that in my studies, during my studies, I could learn just as much, if not more, from other foreigners learning Chinese with me than I could from locals who spoke Chinese fluently. Yeah, sometimes foreigner Chinese was very easy for me to understand. So me and the other students, the other students and I, we would get together and we would uh, uh, study together. And whenever we would study together, it would feel so beneficial, so helpful. And that really gave me a push that I needed. It really kicked my studies up a notch. Okay, so that was my experience of working as a team. All right, last one. Really push yourself. You can do it. Respond to question number three for one full minute. Go ahead. Guys, you did an awesome job today. We tackled this story. We conquered this story. We came, we saw, we conquered, right? But don't let the study session end here. I'm going to put another one of my deep work videos up on the screen. I challenge you to keep going. Yeah, keep learning, keep studying, and I'll meet you there.